So now it's my honor to introduce Nana of Riyata Ayim to you. She came joining us from Accra and will hold the keynote. A few bi biographical notes. Nana is a writer, filmmaker, and art historian who lives and works in Accra, Ghana. She's the founder of ANO, Institute for Arts and Knowledge, through which she has pioneered a Pan-African cultural encyclopedia and a mobile museums project. She curated Ghana's first pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2019, and she published her first novel, The God Child, in 2019, which was actually published in German this year. This is, there's so much more to tell about her because she's a tireless worker, so please find a full biography on our blog, Talking Objects Lab. In her keynote with the title Recreating Ecologies of Knowledge, she will talk about the necessity of a transformation of relational interdependence that encompasses the cultural, political, financial, the social, and the spiritual, with a critical look at the so-called universal museums built on imperialistic models of subject-object, she's asking for a more pluralistic, equal, and inclusive model. Nana, we are very, very happy to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Isabel and Marit, for the invitation. Um, hi to Njoki, Chow, Jim in Nairobi, um, and hello to everyone else as well. Um, I'm not sure to what extent my talk actually correlates with the paragraph that I sent, um, but we'll see. So we're obviously living through a time of crisis at the moment of health, of race, of justice, um, with, more and more, it, with more and more becoming aware that dynamics of the world, as they've been imagined so far, cannot prevail. And that a transformation of relational interdependence, i.e. one that encompasses the ontological, the cultural, the polit political, the financial, social, ecological, and spiritual, is due. In 2013, um, I made a film and put together a research exhibition around the themes of oil and development in relation to Ghana and Norway. We discovered oil not long before, and we're using Norway and its approach as a template of how to navigate our oil find. It was in researching this that the very paradigms of development, of progress, of extraction, reveal themselves more and more as intractably problematic. The idea of the West as the end, the ideal of progress, is obviously a colonial hangover, one that seems to pervade every sphere from education to politics and art, even the narratives we tell ourselves of our becoming which are mostly delineated as and centered on the pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial. And yet these very ideals have continued to produce inequality, marginalization, and exclusion of large parts of the population. In the cultural sphere, we see this at the moment in the field of so-called universal museums, which are built almost entirely on the imperialist models of subject and object and that which are currently being deconstructed and reimagined through the discourses of decolonization and restitution. Although these recent efforts of decolonization seem to want to de deconstruct these hierarchies and presumptions, they often remain within the very same paradigms. The restitution debate, for example, in which allies fight loudly and insistently on behalf of their African counterparts towards an end goal which they deem best. A case in point, I had to recently leave the Action for Restitution to Africa program because it centered on a dynamic that seemed to strengthen coloniality, the north-south divide, as well as patriarchal systems. A dynamic that was born out of the reduction of the world to Western epi epistemology, of the production of the West as hegemonic. A universality or modernity or development model which constantly necessitates the other to be inferior, traditional, primitive, pre-modern, third world, or alternative. A monoculture of universal knowledge, which is itself bound by a specific particular set of values and conventions, and yet still continues to define others as local and particular, whilst laying claim to objectivity. 
How can this model of dominance and one-sidedness be replaced with dynamics more relational and pluralistic, more equitable and inclusive? One thing that's clear is that there must be a radical and structural, structural institutional and epistemetic de epistemic departure from the prevailing paradigms and boundaries. Emancipatory social change must come with epistemological challenges. Wow, these words are very big. Sorry if I fall over them. Must come with epistemological changes. And the reimagining of a monoculture of scientific knowledge with that of ecologies or constellations of knowledges. My work over the last couple of years has led me deeper. Oh, I forgot. I was going to welcome you in a traditional way that we welcome audiences in Ghana before I start, but I'll do this. OK, now. So I'll talk about what he was saying in a second. Um, but just to go back to the talk, my work over the last couple of years has led me in deeper into study of what we still call indigenous knowledge systems, although obviously the term in itself is problematic, and the scopes that lie within them, as well as to parallel conversations in, co with colleagues in what we still call the global south, though I'm sure that will change as well, that terminology in the near future. What's emerged both in these investigations and in the conversations is that the patriarchal capitalist world, which was built on deliberate suppression and domination of other knowledge systems, as well as a separation and domination of humans and other modes of beings, is being challenged and replaced with other modes. In the indigenous knowledge systems, consciousness and meanings are often present in all beings and matter. They're non-dualistic, plural, pluriversal, non-static, and dynamic, and in constant flux. There are multiplicities of worlds and peoples coexisting in ways that are circular and interdependent. In conversations with colleagues from Kenya, Senegal, South Africa, Vietnam, St. Vincent, Brazil, Colombia, and especially looking into what's happening at the moment in Latin America, it becomes clear that these new paradigms that we're all searching for, these new frameworks, emancipatory practices are already beginning to form around concepts like pluriversal, pluriversalism, post-developmentalism, degrowth, buena vida, etc., and the convergence of movements across conceptual and also geographical boundaries, like so social justice movements, ecology movements, and movements of indigenous peoples and workers. Over the next years, one comes out of these investigations and conversations um, and networks will become more and more apparent, and not through what we've come to know as the centers or through the usual channels or voices, which right now are busy, busy loudly competing for which of them is more decolonial, but through the pluralities of realities, platforms, and net for networks that are all the while quietly forming. I want to outline for you a few of the ecologies I've been working on across the years and have drawn on them as examples of new possibilities. I'm going to start with the Ayan, which is drum poetry.
he was playing right now was what we call the atom pan, the talking drum. Um, this was filmed in my hometown in Chebby. And what I'm going to show in a minute is how an example of how the drum actually speaks. So he will speak over the drum in the way that the drum is speaking, and then I transcribe it in English. This is part of a bigger film, so more than stuff. On. A suo chow quine Open in the wine Open chess woo A suo chow quine Open in the wine Yabo quine got to a suo A suo ni fitty Okay, so that was an example of the Ayan or drum poetry. Um, I became quite obsessed with the Ayan some years back when um, I was studying many years ago um, African art history and um, found it problematic that all the theories and concepts that I was using to look at the Ayan were Western concepts, hermeneutics, phenomenology, etc. So when I began to look for theories and concepts from within my own context, obviously I started drawing on oral histories and I, I came across the Ayan, which was a way of telling history and of um, holding and constructing memory. So the Ayan, or drum poetry, um, is possible because of the proximity of language and music. So that the drum, by following the tones of language, tells poetry. Um, there are many different types of talking instruments in Ghana. Um, instruments that are near enough to speech so that the listener can reinterpret what he hears in verbal terms. Um, rhythmic groups, as you heard, of linear or linear units correspond to what are called breath or sense groups. And they can be termed together in rhythmic groups, which are known as sound sequences and linear units. These are all terms that the great um, musicologist J.H. Nketia, who I'm sure many of you have come across, um, formulated. The oral impression of these is as a series of rapid notes and beats which are sequenced and delimited by pauses of longer duration than they contain within themselves. The languages in which drum language is possible are mostly tonal. This means that every syllable has its tone, and tone depends on the meaning of the words and its grammatical structure. So that the past tense of a verb may be pronounced by a higher or lower tone than the present tense. So the meaning of the word is dependent on tone. The musical language of the tone languages means that intersyllabic um, structures manifest musical aspects. These Poetry's aesthetic principles, the juxtaposition of fragments, and their apparent formlessness um, has challenged conventional Western critical assumptions and historical analyses. They're often elusive, elliptical, fragmentary, fluid, non-narrative, and full of dynamic ambiguity. There's no attempt to link causally or temporarily the events they allude to. They're not intended as a historical chronicle. They're not descriptive. They're not narrative. They're not complete. They're not, they don't contain all the possible themes or reference to a person or to events, but they're rather impressionistic. They're evocative. They're cyclical rather than linear. And as in the polyrhythmic beats of a musical drum, the offbeat, what is not beaten, is as, impo as important as a sounded beat. What is left out is as important as what is drummed. The identifying characteristics lie not in meter or stress, which tend to be irregular and variable, but in the structural and thematic place of sound, the stylistic devices of tone and the rhythmic relationships and the seemingly arbitrary ordering of stanzas. And intricacy of rhythm and structure is apparent in the differences in length between stanzas, stanzas audibly and visually uneven lines, the cluster of identical vowel sounds and buzzing consonants, repetitions, breaks, and silences. It's an incredibly 
fascinating form to delve into. Um, it's full of dynamic ambiguity, um, disjunctiveness, um, but there is at the same time a sense within each of the phrases. Um, each of the autonomous units can be interchanged, they're flexible, um, the eye of the subject can be male or female, it can move between specific and generalized people. Um, so this idea of the overall formal and also conceptual pattern being flexible, of improvisation being the norm, of the text being constituted anew each time you drum it, um, of the performer being in charge of varying the order um, is, is, is something that I found when first going into it quite alien to the way that I had been um, educated within the Western canon. This kind of indeterminacy of relations was something that um, something that drew me in, in a very deep way and every work that I've done since discovering the Ayan has to some extent been informed by it. And so my question as I've been dealing more and more with the Ayan is how do you create not necessarily a structure, but some kind of ecology that is based and, and inspired by the Ayan, which is not necessarily one that's concomitant with the Western canon, but one that honors its own impetus. I'm going to just speak a little bit about the poem that you saw drummed um, in a few minutes ago. So the words of the poem are, the path crosses a river, the river crosses a path, which came first? We found, the path, we found the river and made the path. The river is from eternity. And a lot of the poems that you hear in the drum language have this notion of nature, the prevalence of nature. Um, we have a lot of ceremonies in my hometown, um, which are called a fascia, which people translate as, as festivals, even though I don't think the word festival really conveys what these total works of art are. Um, every morning um, at dawn, before these afashia start, the drummer goes into the drum house and he starts drumming a series of poems that we call the awakening or the anyani. Um, and within the anyani, studying these sets of poems, you realize a, a kind of philosophy of man or of woman as being interdependent with the rest of the universe starts to emerge. Um, the interaction between visible and non-visible beings. Um, so, for example, the structure starts with the drummer announcing himself to God, to Mother Earth, um, to the ancestor drummers, and then to each of the elements that he uses for the drum. So, for example, the, the drum is made of wood, pegs, sticks, um, string, etc., and to each one of them, he says, I am learning, help me to succeed. So he humbles himself in front of the elements and asks them to come to his aid to strengthen him. And all of the components of this particular atom, Pam Dran, which is a sacred drum, which I actually, as a woman, um, I'm not allowed to touch unless a sheep is slaughtered, but that's a whole other story, um, are chosen for their inherent spiritual power. So there's Specific trees in Ghana that we all know have some kind of sacred power, the Kodua, the Trinibua. Um, and these are the trees that are used for carving specific objects. So the spirit or the sunsum of those trees carries into the object. Um, before the drum maker even cuts the tree, he goes into the forest to the tree to try and placate the forces. Um, so that, at, because he's, he's, he's destroying the abode of that sunsum. He'll know the sacred days of that tree. Um, he'll bring a bottle of schnapps to the tree and ask the tree um, if it gives it permission, gives him permission. Thank you. If it gives him permission to cut it down. He um, pulls libation after he's cut it and he takes it back to his village. For those of you who don't know what libation is, um, it's 
a glass or a calabash or a container of water or schnapps as we, we, and we pour it on the ground like this and we call to the ancestors to come and join us um, and which we do at many and every occasion. So he pours libation um, asking the log to let the village, the, the, the spirit of the tree to let the um, village prosper. He pours it again when he's um, shaping the, the, the tree into a drum and also for help to, to thank the spirit to help him, help, for helping him succeed in making the drums. And then once the drum is finished, he thanks the drum again and invites the spirits of the drum to accompany to him to where the drum is going. So at every single stage, there's a communion or communication between the spirit of the drummer himself and the spirit that's inherent in the tree. Nothing is done without the agreement of that spirit. And later, when he starts to drum, before he even starts to drum, he calls that spirit and asks it to help him to come in back into the drum and to help him in his performance. Each of the trees, each of the spirits has a name, a strong name as we call them. Um, those of you who know about Ghanaian culture know that we have a lot of names for different things. Um, and so he calls the tree by its appellation. He calls a drum string by its appellation. This just to illustrate that every single object that I've come across within, um, I'd say, I still don't like this concept or term, but I'll call it by that for, for, as a shortcut, but within my traditional culture, um, has more to it than meets the eye. It's cared for by a special group of people. It's placated in a special way. And if you don't know how to do this, you'd better not come close to that object. I just wanna talk a little bit about the drummer himself, because I think this shows um, a little bit also about the kind of person that takes care of the object. Um, and most of the research that I've done is in my hometown. Um, when I've gone into the indigenous knowledge systems, they all talk about the importance of starting with self-reflexivity, of starting with cultural reflexivity. So you don't start from the outside, you start with yourself, you start with your own people. And so that's what I've done. Um, I'm gonna... Oh no, okay, not this one, okay, yeah. Okay, so the people that you see in this picture, on the left is my uncle sitting down, um, a tree above watching Tiram, sitting, standing next to him. On the top is my great-grandfather. So my uncle Boachi Inshira was an Odumon um, um, which is a divine drummer. My great-grandfather was also a divine drummer. Underneath him is Amarquata the first, for whom he was the chief state drummer, and next to him is my grandfather. So I'm just gonna say very a little bit about this because it also shows about how these new um, power structures came in to try and suppress what came before. So um, I, I learned every, almost everything that I know about the Ayan or about drum poetry from my uncle, um, whose stool name was Atriba Boachi and Shira, but whose home name was Fraser Ofuriata. And he was also the Abontin Donhini of, Chene, of Chebi, which is my hometown, which is um, second only to the Ochihini, who's the king. So he comes from a lineage that's connected to the stool and to drumming, and he has a special title, which is Apietu, who's that who he can who can play the drums and has that commitment. Um, again, I'm, I brought this. I'm bringing this particular story and this personal thing in to illustrate the the this deliberate erasure that happened of my knowledge systems and also the deliberate process of fragmentation that happened. So the conversion to Christianity in my hometown and the denunciation of all of our ways started obviously with the influx of the missionaries. My great grandfather, Yao Boachi, who's at the top there, decided to become a Christian at the age of 42. Um, he'd been the king's best friend who was down at the bottom underneath him, who'd made him a state treasurer and also state drummer. Um, the king had arranged for him to marry his cousin, uh, my great-grandmother, Akosia Boadji and Kuma, and she, was, she also converted to Christianity. So what, and all of these records are documented in the archives. We have quite extensive archives, both of the drum and, both, and written, so it's quite interesting to also put them in relation to each other. 
So what um, Yao Boachi said, my great grandfather, was he could not join in anything done in honor of the fetish. Already that word, the fetish. There was Reverend David Asante, who decided to make it his mission to destroy all elements of what he called fetishism. So he went about trying to um, convert all of the main functionaries around the state who were the holders of this sacred knowledge and ceremonies. Um, and there were, and still are, certain sacred days which are part of our knowledge system, days on which you can't farm, days on which you can't fish, um, days on which you can't um, gold, dig, dig for gold. And those days are part of our way of conservation. We allow the earth to rest, we allow the waters to rest. Um, and so there's records also of Amarquata the first, who's in that picture below, saying, these days belong to my stool. I cannot allow the Christians to work on the mentioned days. Whosoever wants to work on such days should buy himself his land. And so already you see how this idea of communal land, which belonged to everyone, starts becoming privatized. There's all kinds of transitions and transformations going on with the repression of our, of our, of our ways of being. He also says, must I let my horn blowers, my drummers, my pipers, my sword bearers, my hammock carriers become Christians? If I do, then I can no longer carry out my ceremonies, nor can I receive foreign embassies worthily. Whosoever has an obligation to serve me will never be allowed to become a Christian. I found this very interesting because our knowledge systems are by their nature pluralistic. You know, you don't just pray to one spirit, but there's, there's a whole pantheon of spirits that you ask for different things. And so this idea of the ex exclusionary nature of Christianity starts coming in. And what's also interesting is that the people that he mentions, the protectors, the carriers, the players of objects, um, in the process of guarding and interacting with these sacred objects also become sacred themselves. So the Otrima or the Odumonkuma Otrima, the, the divine drama, which is a, even like a, a, a deeper form of the drama than, than the Otrima himself, provides a link to both sides of the spiritual boundary. He's able to call not just to those present here, but also to the ancestors and to the unseen forces, invoking their presences so they're the imminent in the atmosphere of the gathering. He recognizes more than just the material human condition, but also those unseen forces um, that need communication, that need empathy, appeasement, all in order to cre cre create this harmony of being between the seen, the unseen, and all the different material forces and immaterial ones. Um, and so just as well to say that those, um, okay. Um, so just as well to say that those um, keepers of objects, the guardian of, guardians of objects, were heavily trained, not just in, in, in terms of worldly knowledge, but also in spiritual knowledge. And I'll come to that a little bit um, later. So the drum is usually played at Afashir, which, as I've said, is translated to festival, even though one of the things that I've noticed, actually, is the problem of translation that we have when talking about, our, again, this word indigenous knowledge systems, our traditional knowledge, they're all so weighted. Um, a traditional priest is called a fetish priest. Uh, a fascia is called a festival. None of these translations convey the deep and layered meanings of what these act what concepts actually mean. So there's a whole nother project of translation and retranslation that's part of what we're doing as well. But the fest festivals, I'll use again the word as a shortcut, are in themselves polymelodic and they're polyrhythmic. Like the ayan and their drum poem, they're built on repetition of rituals and prayers, libations, um, sacrifices, gestures, and dances. Um, they're repeated. Um, many, many, many things are going on at the same time. You have lots of drum orchestras happening. You have design, cacophonies of design. You have um, reenactments, you have rituals happening. And these total works of art, for me, as I've always seen them since I've been young, are types of living museums. You know, the, the Ochihini or the king might come out in a smock that is 
four, five, six, seven hundred years old. It might be falling apart at the seams, but it's full of history. And it's not just seen by an elite few, but the whole of the kingdom, the whole of the community, everybody who comes into it. And so I've always thought of, of the Afashia as these really open, um, living, dynamic forms of museums, again, for want of a better word. Okay, I'm just going to show you, um, I talked about the Ayan, but I also want to show you that there's elements like dance, for example, that um, have a whole, I think it's a slide before this one, that have a whole, um, no. It's, no, it's the next one. Yeah, this one. Okay, so again, this is um, one of my cousins. Um, and I just wanted to show as well that the dance in itself, every single gesture that he's making now is language. He's communicating, again, not just with the drummer, not just with the audience, but also the unseen forces. You'll see if you see the whole video that he's actually got a broken leg. And as soon as he stops dancing, he starts, um, what's the word, limping. Um, but as soon as he starts dancing, it's almost like the limp has gone. And I remember after this, he was in a great deal of pain because of this. Um, the writing that you see is actually because, so my, my cousin died not long after this, and I created this film as a kind of drum poem to him. But OK, so that was just to show also that there are many different forms of ecologies of knowledge, not just in the ayan, not just in the afashia, but also in dance. I also want to talk just a little bit about the stool itself, because I think most of you who've been into museums have seen the stool, the stool that they call the Ashanti stool or the Akan stool in museums, um, decontextualized in behind glass cases. And I want to also talk just a, very shortly about the stool itself. Um, So this, just to show you briefly, is the golden stool, which is probably our most famous stool, which belongs to the Ashanti people. I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. So the fascia are often held for people to realign themselves, to cleanse themselves, to really realign themselves with a stool. So the king actually doesn't hold any power in himself. He derives all of his power from the stool from the power of the ancestors which are held within the stool. It's a collective sunsum, the spirit of the ancestors that is held within it, within the stools. It's the essence of past rulers which are present within our ancestral stools. And it's the stool, the object, that gives the king his, legit his legitimacy. Um, so as I said in the ayan, the eye of the king is also the eyes of every king that has come before him as encapsulated within the stool itself. And the drum language encapsulates this in continuity. Um, and there's a big distinction between the eternal power of the stool and the temporary and very mortal person sitting on it. So when someone swears allegiance to um, the office, it's not to the king himself, but actually to the stool. Um, and this is reaffirmed every year. We have a festival called the Odriwa, where the king is actually locked out of the palace and has to beg to come back in um, because of his mortal being. So um, the royal stools, are, or the stools are kept in a place that are called the stoolhouse, Akonyadain, which is our type of museum. Again, that word is limited, and I, I, I'm kind of using it only in translation as a shortcut. But the stools are kept in certain positions within the stool house. Some are placed against walls so that souls that are passing might sit on them. And each stool is understood to be the seat of the owner's soul. The official keepers of the stool house, the, the, head, the stool bearers and those that work with him, have to have a specific spiritual knowledge to perform specific duties. duties. For example, they can't place the stool on the ground. Um, it has to be cut and placed on um, particular blankets or rugs. Um, some can't be carried by hand. They have to be carried on the pillow as the stool 
the, the soul bearer, only the soul bearer of the stool is allowed to hold it. Um, this is all just to illustrate that not everybody has the power or the tumi to handle every kind of object. Um, I also want to touch briefly on some of the attributes that in the West might be seen as purely aesthetic, and that's color. So when a king dies, if he's been, or queen mother dies, if he's been very powerful, um, the stool is blackened. Because for us, the color black is kind of symbolizes the height of power. So we have this, um, if you go to a lot of Akan ceremonies, you might notice there's um, a tripartite system of color, white, red, and black. So we wear that at funerals, we wear it at birthing ceremonies, etc. So these colors, red and white and black, are no accident. Um, they have an individual collect dimension, they have a cultural dimension, they have a cosmological dimension. So for example, um, I, as, as an individual, am made of the colors red, white, and black. Um, or, every, or all individuals are. Um, red is the color of earth. It's a female essence of fecundity, land, and earth. White is the color of water, the male essence of fertility, insemination, and the ability to pen penetrate and cleanse. In black um, is the color of air and also the essence of power the ability to put energy and motion into the other two. So it's a kind of meeting of these three colors that make a whole. Okay. Um, okay, so there's also another, other meanings of the colors um, on more collective levels. And the blackening of the stool is regarded as the highest honor. Um, and there's certain ways that the school is blackened, but I won't go into that. I also just wanna say briefly how with the golden stool that you just saw there, um, in um, the Ashanti king was, was um, exiled as a result of trying to protect the stool. In, 18, in 1900, a very arrogant gentleman by the name of Frederick Hodgson came to the Ashanti kingdom and demanded um, that the golden stool be presented to him um, and that he sit on it. So the archives say, you know, where is the golden stool? Why have you relegated me to this ordinary chair? Why did you not take the opportunity of my coming to Kamasi to bring the golden stool for me to sit upon? He was met with silence. Um, and after that, he gave the speech. Um, I'm sure many of you know Ya yeah, Santua, one of our great warrior queens, made a speech to the men who were left behind and said, no foreigner could have dared speak to a ruler of the Ashanti in the way the governor spoke to you rulers this morning. Is it true that the bravery of Ashanti is no more? I cannot believe it. I might say this, if you the men of Ashanti will not go forward, then we will, we the women will. I shall call upon my fellow women and we will fight to the last of us falls on the battlefield. This was all in protection of the stool. So what started then was the war of the golden stool solely to protect the golden stool. Um, I just, Okay, I know my time is up, so yeah, can I, no, go back. So I just as well briefly want to um, touch on an indigenous knowledge system that, how much time have I got, I have to finish? Okay, two minutes? Okay, so I just briefly want to touch on an indigenous knowledge system that I've been delving into, which is one of the Ewe, which as you can see, um, is quite complex. It has six elements, which is um, the knowledge of existence, mythology, education system, the arts, psychology, science, and technology. Um, it's incredibly inspiring because I had no idea that we had knowledge systems that were so categorized. I'd love to talk about it more, but I don't have time. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, briefly, I can just say about it that, um, I mean, Felween, I think, will probably take it from here because this knowledge system, or not take it from here, you're doing your own thing, but it kind of interconnects with, what you, with, with the idea of music um, because this is a knowledge system th through which you get entry into through music. Um, and the idea is that the music helps you and the practice of music helps you to unlock your own soul, which helps you then to unlock the mysteries of the world. Um, but I, I'll talk about it another time. And so just to end, 
I just wanted to show a little bit in, in, in a minute how um, the, these knowledge systems that I've been studying have informed my contemporary production. The, on the left, you see the novel, which stru whose structure has been completely informed by the drum poetry. On the right, you see a project that I'm working on in my hometown, which is in the rainforest, which has to do with ecology and conservation. On the left, you see um, what we're trying to do is create a new type of museum, which is right for our context. And on the right, we're actually trying to see how can indo indigenous knowledge systems be passed on through education. Um, and then finally, to end on, um, these are projects that I'm working on the moment. On the top are mobile museums. On the bottom uh, is the Culture Encyclopedia, which is um, a documentation of indigenous knowledge systems within Ghana at the moment. Thank you.